Down the long path of history, tramping across centuries and continents and the graves of kings and the necks of dictators, seeking always a way of life where the people have their freedom, believing, praying, fighting, dying, we came this way. <laughs> NBC University of the Air, a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its independent affiliated stations, presents another chapter in the historical series, We Came This Way, a dramatic account of man's struggle down through the ages for a democratic way of life. For listeners at home and overseas, we present Chapter 4, Walt Whitman, Poet of Democracy, on We Came This Way. Walt Whitman, poet of democracy, the tendency of whose pages is to destroy those old landmarks which pride and fashion have set up, making impassable distinctions between the brethren of the great family, to make us love our fellow creatures and own that although social distinctions place others far higher or far lower than we, yet are human beings alike as links of the same chain. Starting from fish-shaped Pomonok, where I was born, well-begotten and raised by a perfect mother, after roaming many lands, lover of populous pavements, dweller in Manahatta, my city, or on southern savannas, or withdrawn to muse and meditate in some deep recess, and happy, having studied the mockingbird's tone to the flight of the mountain hawk, solitary, singing in the west, I strike up for a new world, the boy said you want to see me, Mr. Van Anden. Come in, Walt, and shut the door. Pull up a chair. Mr. Van Anden, this is another warning about what you're going to let me put in the paper and what you're not. Now, see here, Walt Whitman. You'll grant that I am the proprietor of the Brooklyn Eagle. You're the proprietor, but I'm the editor. And I put whatever I please in the Eagle, so long as I am editor. Yes, but you listen to me for a minute. I've given you a pretty free hand. Not on the question of free soil. I've let you be any kind of a crank you wanted to be in the columns of the Eagle for two years now. You're getting out of hand, Walt. Mr. Van Anden, you make it sound as though I was some bird in a cage. I've never been in hand. Now, about that editorial concerning General Cass's letter to Nicholson. It's a fair proposition, Walt. I don't think so. Well, I agree with General Cass. As the new territories open up, let them decide for themselves whether they want slavery or not. And I say... Well, you've got the editorial there on your desk. Yes. I was looking it over for the tenth time when you came in. And we don't have to go all over that again. It's a dangerous issue. And so we'll just avoid it? Mr. Van Enden, the new territories have got to be free by law. And I'm going to keep on saying that in the Eagle just as long as I'm editor. Walt, you are not editor of the Eagle anymore. Well... Sorry, Walt. No but... regrets, Mr. Van Anden. And no hard feelings. I'll just move on. A foot and light-hearted I take to the open road. Healthy, free, the world before me. The long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. Henceforth I ask not good fortune. For I myself am good fortune. Henceforth I whimper no more, postpone no more, need nothing. Strong and content, I travel the open road. It was 1848 and 49 that I was occupied as editor of the Daily Eagle newspaper in Brooklyn. The latter year, I went off on a leisurely journey and working expedition through all the Middle States down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. What 
widens within you, Walt Whitman. What climbs? What persons and cities are here? What do you hear, Walt Whitman? I hear the workmen singing and the farmer's wife singing. I hear in the distance the sound of children and of animals early in the day. Yes, and I hear also the wheeze of the slave couple as the slaves march on, fastened together with wrist chains and ankle chains. I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear. Those are mechanics, each one singing his as it should be. Blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. Singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. What do you see, Walt Whitman? I see diminuted farms, hamlets, ruins, graveyards, jails, factories palaces, hovels, huts of barbarians, tents of nomads. I see the constructiveness of my race. I see the results of the perseverance and industry of my race. I see the ranks, colors, barbarism, civilization. I go among them. I mix indiscriminately. And I salute all the inhabitants of the earth. I lived a while in Gay, New Orleans, and worked there on the staff of the Daily Press newspaper. It is time now, Grisette. I must go back to the Crescent office. No, you stay with Grisette. Well, I want to, ma chérie, but I must put down my impressions of the carnival for the newspaper. Let's skip down this side street and get away from the crowd. I must get to work. Already the gentleman who owned the Crescent grumbled because Did I... Did you think... not like the piece you write about Grisette, no? It's not bad. I know. You go back to your Brooklyn. You leave Grisette alone. Now, ma petite, now, But you now. will. Suppose we go now to the place where the old woman sells us coffee. I have a poem. I'll read it to you there. Is it about Grisette? You wait and see. No. You read it to me now. Yes. <laughs> well, all right. What is it about? It's about a city. Oh. And a woman. Oh. Once I pass through a populous city, imprinting my brain for future use, with its shows, architecture, customs, traditions. Yet now of all that city, I remember only a woman I casually met there who detained me for love of me. Day by day and night by night, we were together. All else has long been forgotten by me. I remember, I say, only that woman who passionately clung to me. Again we wander, we love, we separate again. Again she holds me by the hand. I must not go. I see her close beside me with silent lips, sad and tremulous. After a time, I plodded back northward, up the Mississippi, and around to and by way of the Great Lakes. To Niagara Falls and Lower Canada, finally returning through central New York and down the Hudson. In 1855, I commenced putting leaves of grass to press for good at the printing office of my friends, the Brothers Rome in Brooklyn. I had great trouble in leaving out the stock poetical touches, but succeeded at last. Well, Walt, there's your book. The first copy of Leaves of Grass, fresh from the printing press. And it better be the way you want it this time, Walt. Andrew and I have made up our minds there'll be no more changes. It looks good to me, James. Very good. My brother and I think so, too. But the real question is, how many copies are going to be sold? How will folks take it? That depends upon the kind of folks they are. Professor, have you read the new book by this fellow Whitman? I regret to say I have. 
And to think he calls himself a poet. Why, this dreadful stuff doesn't rhyme. Besides, it's licentious drivel. Now, my dear, I don't mean to gossip, but... Are you referring to that nasty book that Lucy Morris bought? Yes, I understand she keeps it hidden away in her bureau drawer for fear it will fall into the hands of her daughter. Or her husband. Well, Walt, what does this letter say? If it's like all the others... It's not like all the others, James. No? Well, who's it from? Ralph Waldo Emerson. No. You mean the Concord Sage himself? Why, I always thought of him as sitting up there in that rarefied Boston atmosphere. And Well, what's he say? Well... Oh, come on, come Now, on. let me see. Oh, oh, yes, this much will do. I am not blind to the worth of the wonderful gift of leaves of grass. I find it the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed. Why, that's a mighty big thing to say. It's a mighty big book he's talking about, James. <laughs> oh, go ahead. What else does he say? Oh, just that I am very happy in reading it as great power makes us happy. I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Mm, fine words, all right. But what I want to know is, will it sell the book? Sell the book or not, James, I'm going on in my own way as well as I can. I haven't wavered so far, and I'm not going to. I shall speak my mind as God meant me to. of the 13th of April, 1861, I had been to the opera on 14th Street, and after the performance, was walking down Broadway on my way to Brooklyn. When I heard in the distance the loud cries of the newsboys. Boy! Boy! Boy, give me a paper. Yes, sir. Here, sir. It's happened. they fired on Fort Sumter. The volcanic upheaval of the nation, after the firing of the flag at Charleston, proved for certain something which had been previously in great doubt, and at once substantially settled the question of this union. Even after the bombardment of Sumter, however, the gravity of the revolt and the power and will of the slave states were not realized in the North, except by a few. Walter, I know you say I shouldn't, but I can't help worrying about your brother George. I know you can't help it, Mother. But it does no good. This dreadful war. All this fighting is so wrong. Better to fight than to be slaves. You may be right, Walter. But I'm an old woman. Just an old, weary woman. You speak of age in a reproachful way. Can there ever be good in it? Of course. Listen to this, Mother. Women sit or move to and fro. Some old, some young. The young are beautiful. But the old are far more beautiful than the young. Oh, stop. <laughs> I knew it. Don't you like it? Why, of course. It says that every woman is beautiful. And I am a woman. And an old one, too. <laughs> Which, according to your poem, is something extra desirable. Every woman is beautiful, and all women are men's equal. Perhaps, Walter. I know you've told me that before. But I'll I... go, Mother. Yes? This the home of Mrs. Louisa Whitman? Yes, I'm her son. Here's a message for her. Oh, I, I'll take it. Thank you. Walter, what is it? It's, it's a message, Mother. I, I don't know what it is, but... Well, maybe, maybe it's about George. Walter, maybe George is... Mother, it is about George, and, and he's all right. Oh, thank God. He's been wounded, but he's all right. He's in a hospital in Washington. I'm going there to take care of him. Washington, December 29th, 1862. Dear, dear mother, I succeeded in reaching the camp of the 51st New York. I've stayed in camp with George ever since, till yesterday when I came back to Washington. And now that I've lived eight or nine days amid such scenes as a camp furnished and had a practical part in it all, I realize nothing we call trouble seems worth talking about. How your heart would ache to go through the rows of wounded young men as I did and stop to speak a comforting word to them. One young man was very prostrated and groaning with pain. 
nurse. What's the matter, soldier? I, I feel like I'm about to faint. Well, maybe if, hey, if I... You're not a nurse. No, but I... I can try to help you, soldier. Bad enough to be dying in a Yankee hospital. With Yankee nurses. Doctors. Easy, lad. Easy. Don't wear yourself out being bitter. Maybe you'd like some of this fruit I brought along for my brother. There's some candy, too. No. No, I, I don't want anything. I, I just want somebody to write a letter for me. That's all. I, I feel like I'm dying. Don't think about dying, soldier. You'll pull through. I ain't so sure. Of course. I can write that letter just the same. No, but... I'm not a Yankee. I don't care who you are. You're a man. That suits me. What's your mother's name? Mrs. Eliza Robbins. Mrs. Eliza Robbins. Dear mother, I... I want you to know that... that I'm here in this northern hospital in Washington... I, I don't like being with Yankees, but I get stronger every day. I keep on thinking of you, of you, of the old place, of the old place. Don't talk, boy. Try to rest. Just lie back and go on. He's gone. Bearing the bandages, water and sponge, straight and swift to my wounded I go. To the rows of cots up and down each side, I return. To each and all, one after another, I draw near. Not one do I miss. I am faithful. I do not give up. I see President Lincoln almost every day now, as I happen to live where he passes by. He always has a company of 25 or 30 cavalry with swords drawn and held upright over their shoulders. Mr. Lincoln in the saddle generally rides a good-sized, easy-going gray horse, dressed in plain black, somewhat rusty and dusty, wears a black stiff hat, and looks about as ordinary in attire as the commonest man. And I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face with a deep-cut line. The eyes always to me with a deep, latent sadness in the expression. They passed me once very close, and I saw the president in the face fully, and his look, though abstracted, happened to be directed steadily in my eyes. He bowed and smiled. I bowed and whispered, Mr. President. But far beneath his smile, I noticed well the expression I've alluded to. None of the artists or pictures has caught the deep, though subtle, and indirect expression of this man's face. Over the carnage rose prophetic a voice. Be not disheartened. Affection shall solve the problems of freedom, yet. Those who love each other shall become invincible. Sons of the mother of all, you shall yet be victorious. You shall yet laugh to scorn the attacks of all the remainder of the earth. One from Massachusetts shall be a Missourian's comrade. From Maine and from hot Carolina shall be friend triune. <laughs> Goodbye to the war. 
future years will never know the seething hell and the black infernal background. It was not a quadrille in a ballroom. The real war will never get in the books. Its interior history will not only never be written. Its practicality, its deeds and passions will never even be suggested. But although the war was over in the nation of peace, in the midst of happiness and joy came tragedy. <laughs> sure it was you wrapped up in that blanket that way. Come inside the tram, Pete. The horse car business isn't very good tonight. And I... I want to talk to you. Well, you're the only passenger, Walt. I guess the conductor can lay off work a few minutes. Sit down. Pete, I... I understand you were at the theater when... it happened. Yes. I was there. Tell me about it. Well, everything happened so fast. I, I had a seat in the second gallery. The place was packed. But could you see the president? I could look right at him. As a matter of fact, I was more interested in watching his face than I was in the play. I know. And then, well, all of a sudden I heard the pistol shot. Did you know what had happened? I didn't have any idea what it was, Walt. Or what it meant. The shot was sort of muffled. Then when did you know? I knew when Mrs. Lincoln leaned out of the box and shouted. Well, I'll ride to the end of the line and then back. I want to think. <laughs> By many has this union been helped, but if one name, one man must be picked out, Abraham Lincoln, most of all, is a conservator of it to the future. He was assassinated. The union is not assassinated. One falls and another falls. The soldier drops, sinks like a wave, but the ranks of the ocean eternally press on. Death does its work. Obliterates a hundred, a thousand, president, general, captain, private. But the nation is immortal. Listen, Pete, there's only a little more. I'm listening, Walt. You're the only passenger left now. And you can give all your attention to my poem. Go on. Yet each to keep and all, retrievements out of the night, the song, the wondrous chant of the gray-brown bird, comrades mine and I in the midst, and their memory ever to keep for the dead I love so well. For the sweetest, wisest soul of all my days and lands, and this for his dear sake. Lilac and star and bird twined with the chant of my soul. There in the fragrant pine and the cedar, dust and dim. What do you think, Pete? Oh, well, it, it's hard to put it into words. But, well, it, it, it's big. It has to be. For him. Yes. Yes. And and a common man, even a man like me, can understand it. I don't know, but I'd guess it was great. Sort of a masterpiece, maybe. What'd you say you call it, Walt? It's called When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom. 
The times are full of great portents in these states and in the whole world. The horizon rises. It divides, I perceive, for a more august drama than any of the past. Old men have played their part. The act suitable to them is closed. Frontiers and boundaries are less and less able to divide men. The modern inventions are interlinking the inhabitants of the earth together as groups of one family. Never did the idea of equality erect itself so haughty and uncompromising amid inequality as today. Never was there more eagerness to know. Never was a representative man more energetic, more like a god than today. What historic they knew more of these we are approaching. No man knows what will happen next. Who shall play the hand for America in these tremendous games? <laughs> Would you like to know more of the life and times of Walt Whitman portrayed in the program you just heard? A handbook containing life stories of 13 great leaders in the struggle for human liberty has been prepared as an interesting supplement to the broadcast series. To obtain your copy, write for We Came This Way. Address your request to Columbia University Press, Station J, New York 27, and enclose 25 cents in coin to cover costs of printing and mailing. Tonight's script was written by Myron Golden and was directed by Norman Felton. Original music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and conducted by Joseph Galicchio. The role of Walt Whitman was played by McKay Morris. Others in the cast were Philip Lord, Rita Ascott, Claire Baum, Art Seltzer, Bertha Creighton, Sidney Brees, and Art McConnell. This series is presented each week as a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. Next week, We Came This Way will be heard at a new time over some of these stations. Consult your newspaper for complete details. Your announcer is Dave Rogers. This is the National Broadcasting Company.